Well, good evening to you, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome once again to uh, another edition of Beverly's Times Past. And returning uh, with us this evening, uh, the Deputy Fire Chiefs, all of them retired from the Beverly Fire Department. We're very pleased to have with us this evening Mr. John M. Briefy, who retired in uh, the early 80s, 1982, and Deputy Fire Chiefs Bob Bay How do you do? and Bill McPherson. Ted. Both of them also retiring in the in the decade of the 1980s. How does it feel, fellas, to be out? Best job we ever had. Was it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Enjoying enjoying life oh, these days. I enjoy good. pretty well. Taking taking things easy, you know. Oh, Bob, uh, anything in your itinerary these days? Are you involved? Oh, in I'm it? still going to yard sales and auctions and still collecting. Uh huh. I know I tried to call that's, you a few that's times. My, that's my hobby now. Tried to call you a few times during the day, you're never home, so I can assume you're, <laughs> you're pretty busy. And how about you, Bill? What, what are you doing? Well, I days? think the grandchildren kind of keep me on the, the go most of the time. Yeah. yeah. Good. Good. Well, we have with us here an array of historic uh, memorabilia here. The first item that I'd like to talk about, uh, Bill, is this 1862 piece that you brought along tonight. Would you tell us what you have there? Well, I, uh, this was a gift from Chief Cressy, and it says regulations of the Beverly Fire Department for the year commencing May 1862. And at that time, wow. Chief Engineer was Dan Foster, First Assistant was Nathan Foster, William Moses, Brackett Munsey, Josiah Haskell, Francis Porter, uh, were evidently the engineers, and Nathan Weber was the clerk. And uh, it tells about uh, how you could get fined if you didn't show up to so many of the alarms and so forth. The company had the, the right to vote you out. Huh. And uh, of course, times have changed since then, but uh, uh, something about, uh, oh, I'm reading here, no intoxicating liquors shall be kept or drank in either said engine houses by any member or any engine company, and, uh, and so forth. And uh, yet, uh, according to some of the uh, memorabilia that Bob has there from some of the engine houses, I, I think that they kind of slid by on that. Of course, they were all volunteers, and uh, the rules were eased. Re a bit they they were the eased years. a bit on certain occasions. You know, it was, it's funny. You're looking at the old records down to Engine Two now, where it was mostly Irishmen. They drank whiskey up in Centerville. They had a hard cider when they were had a party. So, what did they tell you? That tells you something. <laughs> well, they had their wine. <laughs> <laughs> well, then we've heard stories of the rub too. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's that's for sure. So this was during the Civil War period. This yeah, that's right. That's yeah. Yeah. Old. That's, yeah. A, that's a beauty. Yeah, yeah that's sure uh, see all this fancy scroll work around there. This was. Uh, like I said, one of the pieces of memorabilia that uh, Chief Cressy had there in his house, and uh, that's one of the things that he gave me alongside with a Terrific. couple of other things there. Terrific. Now, Bob, you brought along two pieces, very interesting pieces here in front yeah, of this us. This is Chief Grant helmet, and uh, his initials are on here, RHG, and this is his belt that he used to wear, a sign of authority. And I brought up an, an interesting piece here. Uh, this is what the chief of the fire department used to give his orders through. So he would broadcast or send his voice through this thing. And, and this is a, there was two types of fire trumpets. This is called a fire trumpet. One is a presentation, which is usually silver or plated. And the others were working trumpets, were, which was brass or tin. Uh -huh. And when a fire chief retired or they thought of highly of them, instead of giving them the gold watch, which uh, corporations do today, they would present them with this fire trumpet. Right, right. Now, is that the ceremonial one we're looking at? This Bob? is, yes. This is highly engraved, ornamented. And uh, this is the forerunner of today's bullhorn. I see. I see. Uh, and Chief Grant, of course, was uh, a fire chief that uh, worked until 1932, I believe, John. He That's was right. the, yeah. the oldest uh, people in, in, in Hardis, uh, firemen in Hardis. He worked until he was well into his 80s, uh, 
had uh, stayed on as the Beverly Fire Chief, Chief Robert Grant. Well, okay, John, we have here a 1926... I think uh, I got a copy here. Yeah. Yep, a 1926 version of the Fire Lab boxes, a listing of the boxes, and I thought we'd, as we show these on the screen in front of us, I thought we'd comment. It, 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 to me, it was interesting, number one, to note that some of the streets uh, in 1926 that were in the various wards have been transposed into other areas, other ward areas. Uh, I would imagine, Bill, that was due to the way Beverly grew and the way more or less the population they, they shifted expanded. the precincts and the ward. Uh, right. Right. Uh, looking here, though, at a Beverly Farms area is pretty much like it is now. It is, now. yeah. Mm -hmm. well, we yeah. see here in Ward, uh, ward 4, for example, Cabot and Milton Street, Charnock and Essex were all considered part of Ward 4 in those days, and I doubt today, uh, Bill, that they are. No, areas. they've uh, yeah, the ward changed four area. the ward lines all sure. around due to the influx in the population. Of course, they had to evenly divide it up because yep. of the voting. Yep. Now, this that, is something that will probably, you know, few years, there won't be any fire alarm boxes in Beverly. Right. I think they're going to have to phase them out. Why do you say that? Well, because no one transmits an alarm of fire by street boxes anymore. It's all telephone, uh -huh. you know, 911, mm -hmm. and, and it costs the city money to maintain the wires in, the, in these boxes. Uh, I so I think, they're going to, I think they're going to phase them out. I agree I, to a certain extent, but a sprinkler alarm system automatically sends the alarm in, so that would well, well and that it, doesn't necessarily it, have to be your fire no. alarm box, though. No, but you, it'll, be, uh, it'll be a signal. In, in, in most of the cities where they've done away with the street boxes, per yeah. se, they have kept the master boxes connected to, well, like we'll school, say, nursing school homes, houses, and school nursing homes, homes, and, yeah. and uh, industrial buildings with sprinkler uh, systems, like you said, John. And uh, they've let it stay as such. But the... Uh, the pedestal out on the street is something that uh, I agree. could very well agree. be something of the past in, Actually, in the will go. very future. Yeah. We still see a few of the old police boxes around town, too, various mm -hmm. locations, but of course those have long, long since, since gone. gone their way. Yeah. But, John, down at the bottom here, uh, some very interesting information that I think maybe if you kind of read it out to our viewers. Uh, you know, they, uh, we could once broke out. daily at 6.30 a.m. And one, uh, one at 4, 5, 40, 11.45 a.m. Those are test signals, but I think a lot of people used to live by them. They used to get up, <laughs> they already have their dinner, have the kids all come home by uh, for noon. Uh, I think I found it that way. I know you found it. You found that? Oh, yeah. Kind of like your alarm clock. We had, to be, yeah. we had to be off the street at yeah. 6.30. Yeah. 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 When the yeah. alarm blew. And there's two strokes, the fire is out. Uh, two the stroke repeated at 8 a.m. and 12.15 p.m., no elementary school. And two strokes repeated at 7.15 a.m., no high school. And three strokes, four times fire out of town. And, and uh, four strokes, second alarm. And then they get the ten stroke for police call, I guess. And the, and when you had a general alarm, you had a box number after a second alarm it constituted a general alarm. And you get 7-1 for a mil military call. And you get 1-2-2-1, two, two, one, street department call. And 2-2-2 two, two, two at 5.15 p.m., <laughs> Twilight League baseball game is canceled. So you see, we have a lot of different <laughs> things. Absolutely. But I don't remember half of them yeah. in my time. But you know, uh, the, the going back to the no Twilight League baseball game, back in the uh, days when we were kids, you know, you'd have two, three, or four hundred people right. up there yeah. watching the sure. Twilight League. So if we did have bad weather, why, uh, you did where a lot of people were waiting to see whether or not the fire alarm whistle blew to... Yep, to see what, yeah. where, where the game was yeah. going to be played or not, uh, for sure. Bob, you were chuckling there over something a minute ago. Something, something come, come to that? your mind here that, uh, about the, uh, the, the alarms here. Uh, for example, uh, the, uh, the military call, and that must have been a, what we would today call the civil defense uh, people. I, uh, oh, back back in those that? days, I, I think it was the, the uh, National Guard. The National Guard. Guard. They'd call them out yeah. like uh, during the time of the Havel flood. Okay. In the, what was it, the late 30s, uh, mid-30s there, I think it was. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, I remember that sounding, and then the uh, police call came on, and they sent a detachment from Beverly up there to Haverhill. Uh -huh. The Merrimack River overflowed. Uh, I see. <clears throat> well, now, and by stroke, of course, that means the hitting of the alarm, right? Is that is that the whistle. definition of that? Yeah, yeah one, one blow on the whistle, one stroke on the gong on the firehouse there. Okay. Well, okay, as we said earlier, now, you fellows worked uh, under a number of uh, different fire chiefs, uh, obviously having retired in the, in the 1980 decade. And I'm looking here at the names of uh, John Cressy and Fred <coughs> Wittenhagen and uh, John Kelly and Dean Palmer. And uh, even, uh, Bill, you worked a bit under uh, Ken Polonzi, who is our present fire chief. Could we say a word, perhaps, about some of these fellows? We've talked about Chief Cressy, and we'll refer to him in a, in a few minutes. But uh, how about Fred Wittenhagen? John, did you, you came I worked, on? I worked under Fred. He kept pretty much to himself in his office, and he kind of administrated everything. He didn't go around to the station much. Okay. And I could say the same thing about Chief Cowley. He uh, administrated, kept mostly in his office and ran the department. Uh -huh. I think Palmer was the first chief that progressed, modernized. He uh, had meetings with his deputy chiefs, were formalized. We, uh, we had a training program. And we had an arson uh, investigator with a and a fire prevention program. So I think Palmer was the first step forward, in my opinion, of the the, new, the new technology the, uh, era. Yeah. yeah. Bob, do you agree that there was a contrast between Chief Wittenhagen and Chief Cressy, who preceded him? Um, Cressy and Witt. Well, uh, let's see. Cressy, Wittenhagen, and Cowley all came up there. Up their fathers were firemen. I see. <laughs> so uh, they sort of ran in the in the line of you know family line. Yeah. Uh, I don't think Palmer's. Although he had a... He, his he brother had, John was about uh, 10 years brother, older than him. Yeah, he, but he their was father was... Uh, no, Although no. He, he did hang around the North yeah. Valley Fire Station yeah. constantly. I don't yeah. think he was... Yeah, he was a cook up there. And uh, so then, uh, let's see, Palmer and then uh, Polonzi, right? Yeah. Mm. But, uh, uh, Bill, 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 there was kind of a contrast between George Cressy as fire chief uh, to be followed by Fred Wittenhagen. The two men were so different. They, they, they were different. Uh, I know that uh, Cressy uh, selected Wittenhagen, who was a captain at the time, to be acting deputy chief for years and years. And uh, uh, I don't know as though they... Uh, thought along the same lines all the time. There, there was a little difference of opinion at times there, but uh, uh, I'll give Fred credit. Uh, he realized that uh, Cressy was the chief and he was the boss and what he said went. Uh, and, and it was ironic, uh, the, the back in those days it was two platoon and uh, even though uh, Cressy was chief, he had the, he had the right to go home and uh, and answer the alarms, multiple alarms, if they came in from there. But uh, the night shift would come on, and Wittenhagen would be in charge, uh -huh. and he'd be there. And uh, and lo and behold, they'd hear this noise coming up the back stair there, and uh, you know, uh, a little grumbling and growling when, when we can't go forward with some of the uh, epitaphs that uh, old Cressy would come out with. But uh, he'd walk into that dormitory in front of the old building there, and fall over a few of the night hitches there and and GD this and that and so forth and and lo and behold the uh, the guys weren't sure just who was in charge uh, because Cressy would be there every night mostly in, in the uh, dormitory in the fire station once in a while he would uh, he would be in this house there yeah. uh, on uh, right around the corner there yeah and uh, but uh, you might say that uh, in, in a way uh, Wittenhagen, who was uh, brought up over there in Pleasant View, some people refer to it as Goat Hill section of Beverly, uh, and his dad was one of the engineers. I remember that my father told me one of the first big fires that he went to there on the corner of uh, Cabot and Washington Street was a Masonic Temple, and uh, Fred's father was an engineer at the time. One of the ladders came down and hit him and really injured him badly. and. Uh, I think he died as a result of uh, yeah. injuries he received at the time. Yeah. Well, I would imagine all of these men had their own 
peculiar ways of getting the job done, and uh, yeah. you just had to adapt, Bob, to each one of them as they came yeah, along. Yeah, they were tough, rough and tough. You know, yeah. I suppose it had to do with the, you know, that uh, the life at that time. It sure. was hard and tough. They, they uh, were raised with uh, horses and, you know, yeah. bulwark. And yep. They were, they were rough. From the old school, as it were. Yeah, from the old <laughs> school. Yeah. We just talked a minute ago. I heard the word cooking mentioned, and it, this might be a, a time here to jump in with a with a question I have for you. What, uh, what, or who prepared the food that you fellows uh, would uh, have to, uh, uh, you know, partake in having eight-hour shifts or sometimes longer and uh, you know, time for dinner? I mean, you had to have some kind of a system, didn't you? A little bit. <laughs> usually, usually the fellows would prepare a day ahead of time and uh, decide uh, as to what they were going to eat, and uh, whoever was elected as the cook, and he usually performed that duty day in and day out. He was he was married to it. If they found out that he could cook, that was it. Uh, uh, he didn't let one way or another. <laughs> they they didn't let go of him, and uh, and uh, of course he'd have one or two fellas to uh, do the. Uh, uh, peeling of the potatoes and so forth, but uh, uh, l let me tell you, they, they put out some real uh, hef hefty meals at times there. Well, yeah, good I think they were self-appointed cooks. Yeah. Then the, they <laughs> they <laughs> had the food prepared for the fellows, and the fellows made the judgment how good they were. Yeah. They weren't too good. We got another guy good. <laughs> yeah. But I imagine yeah. if you found a good one, though, Bob. We, 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 <laughs> we had a good one on my shift, uh, George Rayfield. Yeah. He did most of the cooking. <laughs> And uh, it was funny. I'd be out riding around in the deputy chief's car. I get a call, Code Seven, Code Seven. Everyone wondered what the hell Code Seven was. That meant dinner was ready. <laughs> uh, I, I, I know at headquarters there uh, we had Captain Cal Fiore, yeah, and he, uh, boy was he. He was a, a Navy cook. Yeah, right? he was Navy. Yeah, and he uh, in the Navy. He was he, good. His specialty was uh, whitefish, you know, a large size. He'd get down and he'd buy the thing whole, I mean whole, and he'd split it up, clean it out, and he'd make the the, uh, the dressing and stuff that, and then he'd rub the outside with mayonnaise all over there, and I, let uh -huh. me tell you, that, uh -huh. that would melt in your mouth, uh -huh. melt in your mouth. Yeah. Yeah. John, do you recall any of a particular, anyone in particular? Oh, John? yeah, I got a couple yeah. of Italian cooks there, right? Yeah, <laughs> Mirandi and you know, Maglio. Not, yeah. <laughs> what about Bill Cyril? <laughs> no, well, I don't know. I, you, no. you never tried no, some of no, Bill's? No. <laughs> didn't <laughs> didn't, 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 didn't Davey have a cook, too? At the oh, end. Oh, Dave, yeah. Dave did, yeah. 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 Tell me this, what would happen, and I'm sure it had to have happened, the alarm blew in, and the food was in the oven. I mean, what, you don't eat. What, uh, <laughs> you, know, you turn the oven off and, and, and resume the, cooking yeah. when you came back. Uh, I, can, I can remember when I was a captain in North Beverly one time, and uh, I came in in the morning, and there was a crew on at night, and seems seems though one fellow had run over to Henry's, and he, he'd got a steak. He hadn't had a chance to have lunch, and, and uh, he was rather hungry when it came around at supper time, so... He was standing there, and he had some potatoes cut up, and uh, he had the steak in the frying pan. Well, lo and behold, uh, the alarm hit, so he shut the the gas off underneath the pan, and uh, off they took. And it was a house fire, and they were tied up for about an hour and a half. And they come back, and as they're coming in the building, somebody went and opened the doors, and here's the smoke rolling down from upstairs there, and oh, brother. Well, come to find out, one fellow leaning against the wall, he thought he was shutting it off after the captain had left, but he just turned the burner right back on, and all there was was a large-sized cinder left in the fry pan there. And, of course, by that time, the stores were closed, and, oh, yeah. and the fellow went without anything at all to eat there. Oh, oh, oh. That's funny to look back on it now, but oh. not, not so funny no, at the time. At the time. The uh, <laughs> now, to be a little more serious here, I ask you, have any of you ever been injured in the line of duty uh, fighting a fire? And uh, if, if not, hopefully if not, uh, what would be the common type of injuries, John, that one might expect to find? As a well, I, I wasn't, let's see, let me start. I, uh, I think I earned uh, what they call a accidental disability uh, from the 34 years. I had a heart attack after 34 years. Uh -huh. 
uh, after a few months of retirement, I joined a exercise class and adjusted to my uh, uh, diet, and I've been uh, feeling fairly well ever since. And uh, I've been living, been able to live a, a fairly active lifestyle. Yeah. What does somebody get hurt? A couple of guys that work with me, they broke their legs like that, uh, yeah. falling through a uh, yeah. hole in the floor. Bob, I imagine smoke inhalation would be one of the... Yeah, I was fortunate. I didn't have anything serious, but uh, burns and sprains and uh, smoke were most common. Yeah. Yeah. Thank goodness, as you, as you look back on your uh, career to, and you can say that, you know, yeah. guys like... Uh, Every time you went out, I'm sure there, were, there was danger lurking. And uh, Bill, how about yourself? Uh, you ever? We had my share of uh, being overcome with uh, smoke, cuts, burns, and so forth. That uh, goes with the job. Yeah. You've got to expect it, yeah. and uh, uh, it's uh, you. Uh, you know about it before you came on the job, and you more or less expected to run into some of it, and right. you just. Uh, Take uh, it went with the punches, that's sure. all. Okay, now you're on your way to, to a fire. The alarm has come in, you've all jumped into the, the truck or onto the truck, and perhaps uh, being deputy chiefs, you're, you're in your car uh, heading toward the fire. What's uh, going through your mind? And, and when you get on the scene, what is it, John, that you immediately look for? Boys, uh, uh, as soon as you hear the alarm, your mind starts clicking of the area you know pretty well what the burn, the life hazard is, so forth. Uh, and that's what goes through your mind. A lot of things go through your mind. You, you uh, assume responsibility for everything in a deputy chief's position. Uh -huh. When they get there, first consideration of life. Is any life? Locate the fire. If I need some help, call for help. Along those lines. You have to make instant decisions. Yes. You cannot take the time to ponder and and uh, wonder whether you should do this or that. You're right or wrong, you've got to make a You have to yeah. make your decision. And you hope you're right most yeah. of the time. Bob? How about, do you, how yeah, you? about the same, yeah. right. Um, night fires, fires at late at night were my, I, I feared them more than any. Yeah. Uh, you had the life, you had the life hazard at People's night. People are asleep sleep. and, you know. Yeah. Uh, during the day, you didn't have too much life factor. Every, you know, people were up and about, and sure. fires were uh, quickly discovered. And yeah. uh, it was the night fires that were bad. When they come in around midnight, one, two, three o'clock in the morning, uh, I don't like them. <clears throat> I would imagine the anxiety would be as you're going to the fire. You have no idea what you're going to see when you. No, get you there. don't know. You never know what you're going to run up against. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think one of the worst calls, like the. John and Bob said, you know, it is at nighttime, but uh, w when you get the alert tone and uh, the fire alarm operator announces, we are receiving calls for, and w when he uses uh, that language, you know that the neighbors or people driving by are seeing the smoke and or the flames, and you, you've got a real problem on your hand. And uh, as the fellow said, uh, nighttime, that, that's... Uh, that's something you dread, uh, because uh, you have uh, no idea as to uh, the amount of life that are involved, uh, and the uh, number of injuries in the rescue, and uh, you're trying to think, uh, uh, are there any particular hazards there connected with this building? Uh, am I going to be able to ladder the building so that I can rescue the people and getting them out? And also, uh, uh, how many men have I got responding on the apparatus, and uh, also uh, what's my water supply? Yeah. And uh, after you get through with that, then you're thinking about your exposures the minute you run in. And uh, as John and Bob both said, uh, uh, you have to make snap decisions, yeah. and you have to live by them. Uh, hopefully, uh, yeah, you call you call the right ones. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Being the deputy chief, uh, you'd arrive first on the scene nine times out of ten. You'd That's be right. there. Yeah. In a, in, in, to ascertain the situation. Well, I, I, I just can't imagine how uh, stressful that could be over a period of time, you know, to, to have to... It is. ...get into it is. certain situations. 
Let's go back, shall we, to 1947, maybe, and I believe 1955. I'm told there were a series of grass fires here in the... the uh, <laughs> John's got a smile on his face over there. It wasn't grass by the wood fires. Wood fires, <laughs> okay. Wood fires and what, what have you that really uh, took off here in those two particular years. Could we kind of comment yeah. on that a little bit? Yeah, there's a, a wood fire, the most dirtiest and hardest work that I've ever come across. And I never really put out a wood fire. I think Mother Nature, rain, actually extinguished the wood fire, a good wood fire. We tried to contain it so it wouldn't spread, but, uh -huh. but uh, it was a high, dirty work. Yeah. yeah. Where were these fires, Bob? Can you recall back in, in those two particular years where they broke out, where the areas were? Oh, yeah. Or was it all oh, over the city? Yeah. We, uh, we had uh, some bad ones down in back of uh, Ennicott College between Ennicott College and Common Lane. Uh, it, I remember one fire started, well, where the old uh, Montserrat golf course was, and it ended up down on, uh, what is that, Thistle Street, John, down there? Down, yeah. yeah, all the yeah. way through the woods. That might be a couple of miles, two or three miles. Then we had one years ago. I was just a, a, a kid, started at uh, the reservoir up off of um, Brimble Avenue burned all the way to Essex Street, finally ended up over Essex and Cole Street. Mm -hmm. That was quite a big burn. Mm -hmm. But it would be, you'd be down there for four, five, six, seven, maybe a week sometimes. Mm -hmm. I don't I think, Ted, you're referring to the 47 fires. Uh, uh, the three of us were call men back in those days, and uh, remember they pulled us out of the shoe, Bob. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we had a woods fire that was uh, burning deep and it, uh, it destroyed a number of buildings on the Financia Estate. And that was burning between Hart Street and Common Lane. And the difficult part of it was that uh, at, uh, at that time, the only size hose that we operated with was two and a half inch. And I remember uh, we had been down there, oh, I think three days, and uh, Wittenhagen got in touch with the Swampska chief and he rolled up in the back of Central, and I don't know how many thousand feet of inch and a half he had, and everybody felt, oh, gee, this is it. That's fine. He dropped all the holes and took off. Well, number one, we didn't have an adapter that went from two and a half to inch and a half, so they had to get a get a hold of uh, Woodsy up in Topsfield. He made fire apparatus and had a machine shop, so he was making up the adapters that went from... Uh, two and a half to inch and a half. Well, he made them up as standard and come to find out they had iron pipe thread, so they had to make up another set. And w once we got that squared away, then we found out that we didn't have any inch and a half nozzles. We were looking to beg, borrow a steel inch and a half nozzles. And, uh, but needless to say, after the episode in 47, why uh, the city of Beverly did purchase a bunch of their own inch and yeah, a half I hose. Remember, didn't we uh, used to call on uh, 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 county, for state, help, state, yeah, state, county, yeah, yeah. County. yeah but, that, but it, it, one of those fires. Didn't we have the National Guard down there? Well, yeah. That was forty-seven. Yeah. The National Guard and the Coast yeah. Guard. The Coast yeah. Guard set up a big mobile van in front of headquarters. There, they came down from up in Maine. Remember, in Maine, they had the up in West Newfield there, burnt right out to the coast, and uh, the Coast Guard command uh, left there and came down to Beverly and set up and in front of the old uh, station there. What well, question, you felt that we put out a, a wood, good wood fire, wood working wood fire, we can continue. If, if you, uh, you, you'd hit the edges and uh